Hierarchy and exploitation. We all live it. We rarely ask ourselves why we live it and where it came from. So we're going to talk today about uh, the social pyramid and why it exists, how it came into being, or at least super briefly how it came into being as quickly as we possibly can, um, and why we're all convinced regardless of what we live in, a uh, democracy, a republic, a communism, a socialism, why we're so convinced that that's actually not the case. All of these modern incarnations of society are based on hierarchy and exploitation of labor. Doesn't matter if we're talking about governments or we're talking about corporate models or we're talking about uh, military companies. Regardless, that's the way it works. And we're all okay with it. Why? How did that come into being? So at the very top of this social pyramid, as, 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 it, as it becomes established, is the role of, for us, we're gonna call them leaders. Now the leaders have been able to garner surplus and thus status, and of course, now that they have this surplus and status, they get to use it for a couple of reasons uh, that are very important to them. First and foremost, if they control the surplus, they get to decide who lives and dies in a society during rough times, floods, droughts, times of conflict, or war. They also get to, of course, use this surplus uh, to grow their society and thus grow their influence, uh, the people that they get to lord over. And thus, again, it, it, it leads to a rise in status. And then finally, they can use this extra surplus to exchange with other groups that may have excess surplus to achieve these novel items, which then, of course, special status is attached to those. Now, how do they maintain the stranglehold on controlling surplus? Well, they manipulate the ethically constitutive stories to justify their acquisition and their, their ability to determine, uh, again, how that surplus is going to come into existence. Specialization of labor, uh, who gets to be a trader and who doesn't get to be a trader, who gets to have these positions of, of, of specialization. All of these things are used by the leadership. Now, how do they manipulate the stories? Well, the stories, as we've already discussed, uh, entertain two main questions. Why am I here? Well, now it's to serve me, the leader, or uh, the deity above me that gave me my power. And B, what's going to happen in the future? Well, in the future, if you follow everything I tell you to do via, of course, the creative essence, whether it's a, a, a Mesopotamian god or an Egyptian god or even uh, during biblical times, God himself, if you follow all these rules in the future, shit's going to be awesome. You just have to wait till you're dead. So you might be suffering now, but hey, I promise once you're dead, it's going to be so much better. You might even be reincarnated and rise in status. It's going to be cool. Trust me. Just get back to work so we can produce this surplus. Now, the way that this person is able to, this leader, is able to manipulate the stories um, is, is, is somewhat limiting as the population begins to grow. He himself is going to become accustomed to a different lifestyle, maybe want to waste more time doing other things, maybe enjoying his status. And pretty soon that story is no longer going to be adequate. And so this is where questions might arise, especially among a growing population. Now, there are going to be individuals in this society that are going to ask really super good questions that the leader himself can't answer. So if we use the Egyptian example, maybe one of the ditch diggers uh, starts thinking one day, I don't want to dig ditches. This is bullshit. So I'm going to, of course, start complaining to my superiors or those above me that I don't want to dig ditches. And the story of how somehow our leader is the progeny of uh, Isis and Osiris, and he's sometimes a falcon and sometimes a king, none of that makes any sense. I've seen the world. None of that, none of that happens. That story doesn't make any sense. If the questions he's asking are good enough and convincing enough, a smart leader will not just off with his head, a smart leader will co-opt him and convince him, hey, psst, look, those are super good questions. I get it. My story's a little hokey. Whatever. This is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you a little bit more surplus than anybody else. And since you seem like a smart guy, you're going to use that extra surplus and extra time to no longer dig, dig ditches because I know you hate it. You're now going to patch the holes in my story, and if we get enough of you, maybe even make the story a little bit bigger and a little bit more complex and a little bit harder to decipher. That's going to be your role. I will call you priests. So in Egypt, they may have been called the priests, but in general, for our societies, we call them the storytelling class. In ancient China, Confucian scholars, uh, uh, in ancient Mesopotamia, scribes, um, in ancient India, the Brahmin caste, 
Regardless, they all had different names and we still have them today. We have the, the CNNs and the Fox Newses and the BBCs and the Hollywood movies and the, the comic books and the video games. And we have so many different storytellers in our society that many of them even forgot that they are part of the storytelling class, that they're merely meaning to perpetuate society as it exists. We also have a wholly inadequate K through 12 education system, which of course serves state power and hierarchy. The funny thing about that, that system is it's actually not funded very well through excess surplus, but that's a different story for maybe a later video. At any rate, this storytelling class serves to basically socialize everybody else into performing their specialized role in society. And that specialized role leads to eventually the creation of more surplus that is funneled up to the top of society. Well, what's passed down besides stories? Well, eventually the stories became, some of them became more complex, others became simplified. We actually began to transition from orally telling our stories, which, stories, which were nice and malleable when we were uh, hunting and gathering, and we began to want to create permanence in our story, so we invented writing, and we would write them on stone or clay or papyrus or whatever. The idea was that we started to tell stories not about what was or about what could be, but about what is. And even what was or what could be all reflected what was. And of course, it's dictated by people in positions of power. They want to make sure they stay in power, so the stories are going to reinforce their positions of power and why they exist. As we began to write them down, some of them stopped even becoming stories. They just became lists of what you could and could not do in society, or what we call laws. We pat ourselves on the back in modern societies because we live under the rule of law, but we live under the rule of law. Hierarchy, exploitation, coercion, right? These laws have become increasingly increasing in number and complexity. In the land of the free, for example, we have over 23,000 federal laws as of the 1980s, they stopped counting there were so many. They gave up. And that's just federal, not state, not county, or any other ways that we, of course, uh, manufacture laws in modern society. The ancient example would be Hammurabi's Code, the first written law. It's one of the most revered ancient documents. Well, why do we rever revere excuse me, a list of shit we can and cannot do? It makes not a lot of sense if we don't want to live in a society of stratification and exploitation. Anyway, over time, these storytellers and the laws they pass down and the narratives they pass down are not necessarily always going to prove adequate. The populations are growing. So one thing we can say about hierarchy and exploitation is it does lead to growth. That is true. And this growth leads to a larger population in which, again, simply answering a couple of questions, why am I here and what happens in the future might not be enough, and education systems might not be enough to stop people from maybe questioning why they're digging ditches or sowing seeds. So eventually we need to create another group of people to enforce the narrative. In fact, for our purposes here, we'll just call them the enforcing class. In Rome, maybe it's the Praetorian Guard. In feudal Japan, maybe it's the samurai. Uh, or maybe in the modern United States, it is 44 different policing institutions, ATF, FBI, CIA, the list goes on and on and on, all to make sure that we stay in line. 44 different policing institutions. Do we really need that much quote unquote justice in the world? Again, it's about serving exploitation and hierarchy. Now, these enforcers are usually young men that could potentially pose a threat to leadership later on. They're chosen as young as possible and then, of course, taken away from the community, maybe to a, a conditioning camp of sorts or a training camp of sorts, and removed so that they no longer see themselves as holy cohorts of those around them, but as those are meant to enforce the narrative upon them, or in some cases, they're convinced that they are protecting them or serving them or whatever. Now, these internal enforcers, these policers, are, cr are absolutely crucial to maintaining order within the society. And eventually, these societies, as they continue to grow, will begin to notice that they need external enforcers as well. These societies begin to bump into each other. We'll use a cliche example of Egypt and Mesopotamia, and, and, and they're relatively close. We see the various uh, city-states running into conflict with each other, and the conflict might be initially over resources or territory or access to surplus or what have you, uh, maybe a labor force. But eventually, part of the conflict is tied to story. 
the protection and enforcement of the story of different societies. So if we use Egypt as the example, they cannot dare allow Babylonian ethically constitutive stories to leak in. Once they start hearing stories of gods like Enlil or Marduk or Ea or whatever, that might challenge the story of Amon-Ra and Osiris and Set and so on and so forth. Now, why is that a problem? Well, if you've been telling people one version of a story for so long that that's all they believe, once they begin to hear a different version of the story, it might get them to start asking questions. And that's one of the last things you want in a society is people that ask too many questions. They might, heck, they might even revolt. Um, and so you want to maintain that authority by limiting the amount of other stories that are allowed into your societies. For a more modern example, cue the Cold War. A, a very, very clear example, a gross example, if, if we want to be honest here, of how to maintain control over a narrative. Communism versus capitalism and freedom and democracy and so on and so forth. Right? We have, of course, what, what are some of the great stories? Red Dawn and so on and so forth from this, this time period. Where we reproduce in our society what we want to look like while creating an other some sort of evil outsider alien presence that we must be scared of. It's a threat. Uh, they are insurgents. They are communists. They are savages. They are barbarians. They are terrorists. Choose the word. We keep reproducing them over and over again. Now, who the hell is everybody else, right? You might be saying, well, I'm not an enforcer. I'm not a storyteller. Uh, I'm certainly not a leader. Well, what am I? Well, the rest of us are labor. We're labor. We are exploited. We might not think we're exploited because, of course, we buy into the ethically constitutive stories of our society. And we're super comfortable. We're willing to be sheep because our leaders have told us, A, why we're here and what happens in our future. That's enough to make a lot of us docile. And if that wasn't enough, we've got all these cool, complicated stories that reinforce it while also distracting us. Right? I might be playing right, a video game that reinforces the glory of violence and patriarchy, or I might be watching a film that does the same, or I might be reading a book that reinforces uh, uh, the godlike divine nature of my leadership. All of those things serve to keep us in power. And if they're not enough, well, I certainly don't want to serve any time in prison or be beheaded or, or even have to, of course, pay certain fines for breaking any of the rules outlined by my leaders and storytellers. And then, of course, if all of those fail to keep labor in check, and labor's goal is to produce surplus that, again, finds its way up the hierarchy and then disproportionately broken up among the labor system. If all of those fail, the one thing that leadership can rely on is stratification and fracturing of the labor itself. And they do this most prominently through specialization and various non-consequential uh, uh, incentives. So if we use an ancient example, let's pretend we have an Egyptian ditch digger. Our Egyptian ditch digger friend here is tired of digging ditches. However, he is being supervised by a ditch digging uh, supervisor. Now, they're both technically labor. They're both spending their time and energy doing something that produces surplus for those above them. But the ditch digging supervisor gets just a little bit more surplus than the ditch digger, which motivates him to want to maintain control over the ditch digger. It also motivates the ditch digger himself to want to work just a little bit harder so one day he might be ditch digging supervisor and get just a cute little, uh, just a to be ditch digging supervisor and get just a tad more surplus than, of course, his fellow ditch diggers, right? We see this in the modern societies as well, right? We have, of course, fast food workers. We have fast food management. We have corporate management. We have middle management. It's so complex at this point. Most of us don't even recognize where we are in the labor system. The easiest example is fast food worker at a Taco Bell, uh, a corporate crony sitting behind a, a, a computer in a cubicle and professional athlete LeBron James are all still technically labor. Their work serves a higher power above them. Yet they can't even imagine being in the same plight because of the complexity of what we've done with our labor system. We'll also find different ways to fracture our labor system in other ways, right? We'll fracture them based on gender, which we've already discussed. We'll fracture them based on uh, ideas of spirituality. We'll fracture them based on 
um, various unions or various guilds, or in certain epics, we'll fracture them based on race or ethnicity. And even in modern society, we'll find different ways to fracture ourselves, like fandoms, right? Well, I'm of a fan of a different sports team or a different, uh, of course, iconography, like uh, I'm a Star Wars fan and you're a Star Trek fan. Regardless of the example, we will find ways to create division between us to make ourselves feel special. But it's all an illusion, and it is perpetuated over and over again by a rich history of leadership, storytelling, and enforcement.